grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon comes from the Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 4. These verses before us, and he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. I don't know about you guys, if you are movie watchers or Maybe you have a favorite movie. Maybe it's your favorite movie because it's action adventure, or maybe um, for some other reason it's your favorite. But some of our favorite movies are ones that have these great lines in them, and, and we just randomly quote them uh, during the day. You know, just to, you quote a line and then import a whole message that way, like you can with scripture. You quote a verse and oh, import the whole story. So there's just one movie that we love. And there's this one guy, he's sort of short, he, he claims to be really smart, but he kind of falls right through here, okay, and talks with a bit of a lisp, I think. Um, and so his, his famous one line, well, one word that he says a lot is inconceivable, or, or, or something like that, you see, and maybe you know that movie, maybe you've seen it. Um, and so when he sees or hears something that just doesn't make any sense in his head that's just not working out by you know logically or or, or whatever um you know he's a really smart guy and it's not it's not computing he heals out inc inc inconceivable and so um eventually uh this uh this other guy in the in the movie this the spaniard um he, he turns to him and he says uh you know you keep using that word but i, I don't think it means what what you think it means. And so uh, that, that's my best in Igor Montoya. That, that's, that's all it's Anyway, so if you've seen the movie, you know, you know what I'm talking about here. So um, you see, sometimes things are, well, inconceivable, e even to us and more importantly to people out there, right? We take so much in faith, right? It's not logical. It, it, it's just faith. We believe it. Well, not just faith, but you, you get my idea. We, in faith, we believe it because the faith has been worked in us. And when we stop and think about it, we go, wow, that's, that's not logical at all. And we might have some, sometimes say, well, inconceivable. If, if we just think about the birth of Jesus, well, think about it. God, you know, any God for that matter, but God sent his son to be born, okay, through this Virgin Mary. Right now, we're wondering how all that took place. Well, she was made pregnant by the Holy Spirit, okay? All of these things, and then he, he actually is born. That, that he's born into this world, that he would be willing to take on flesh and, and walk around and experience what we experience, to feel what we feel, to see how sin is wreaking havoc in people's lives, how a death occurs and he weeps and so on and so on and so on. That that God would, would even do that for us, just to just to come down and and, and dwell among us. It's really rather inconceivable, isn't it? That he would do just that part. Well then we follow the ministry of Jesus and watch all that he does, all the healing and miracles and amazing things well the the, the persecution the, the the being ridiculed and all of that goes along with it and then he goes to the cross for well not just uh, people he likes or knows or his inner circle his uh, clique or whatever no he, he goes to the cross to die for the sins of the whole world even those who are enemies even the ones driving the nails through him, the one that put the crown on his head, and all those people dying for his enemies. We might say inconceivable. See, it doesn't, doesn't make sense in our logical minds, but it is what it is. By faith, we accept that this was done for us. This faith that we did not create for ourselves, but was created in us by the Holy Spirit so we can really claim nothing and at our baptism where he adopts us and wants us to be his children calls us his 
knows who we are, knows our sins, knows that we will sin and sin and sin some more, but yet adopts us and wants us to be members of Christ's body. All of it. It's hard to get our heads around. There's no way to work it out logically. We just accept it in faith and give thanks. And so I'm kind of wondering about these fishermen who are sitting there, you know, they're minding their own business. They're, they're doing what fishermen do. They're trying to catch fish, repairing the nets, and all that comes with it. And Jesus comes by and says, uh, you know, leave that stuff there and follow me. Quite honestly, I'm not sure if I would go, you know. Do I know him? Have I heard of him? Maybe, maybe I wouldn't go. Maybe I'd at least talk to my buddy about it and see if we should go or not. But immediately, you see, Jesus calls, and it is immediate. And the ones fixing their nets, all right, they left their nets and their father immediately. Wow. And they go. So now they are his disciples, and he leads them all kinds of places, and he shows them all kinds of things, and he shows them how they should interact with people, you see, humbly. Uh, serving, lovingly, all of those good things. Love your neighbor, love your God, love your God first, then love your neighbor. It would just be, it's a natural flow, right? If you love God, of course you'll love your neighbor. And then they watched him also, well, be captured, be beaten and persecuted and all of these things, rejected in his hometown, all of these things. But he leads them to this room, this special room, just before he dies. And there they celebrate the, the Passover meal. And here we go again, right? He picks up bread and he says to them, this is my body. Can you wrap your head around that? You know, anybody who says that they understand what's happening during communion is deceiving themselves. See, This body, this bread is my body. Here. This, this wine is my blood. Everybody there knows it's bread and wine. This has established a new covenant in my blood. See, we might say, wow, it's inconceivable. It doesn't, the logic doesn't work out, but we take it in faith. And then we try to explain that to those out there. We call them those uh, who, who do not attend church, the unbeliever. Have you tried that before? They look at you funny. Maybe. You see, it is, it is a challenge. So we have to go in it thinking, it's not going to make any sense. So you go at it, well, in faith, this is what I believe. This is in God's word that, he, that he's told me, and, and I believe it. So we go out witnessing our faith. We don't try to logic with, you know, with logic and science and all that. Forget that. Um, we accept this in faith. Um, and so these guys, you see, after Jesus is resurrected, he comes to them and he, he sends them out. He says, you're not staying in the room, okay? You don't get to hide here forever. You have to go out. I'm sending you out just as the Father sent me. So these who follow him are also sent. So, see, that's us too. We both follow him, but we're also sent out to, to share this message with others and how powerful it can be. Sometimes we're called to say, hey, um, repent. You see, this, this is a sin. Repent and, and know that Jesus died for, for this sin or how great it can be when someone is having a terrible time, the, the, the burdens of their their life, the, the sin that's coming from in the world into to them, or even if it's they've committed the sin themselves and it's causing all kinds of trouble. You see, we're both, it's the both end. It's either coming from here or from here, and usually both. But how great it can be for somebody to hear that even in this mess, yeah, maybe you created it or maybe it came to you, that Jesus loves you, that, that he died for you, and he's offering forgiveness, and he's offering peace and comfort and mending of your life, not just 
a mending of a net, but mending of your life is what he's offering you. And then eternal life. After that, be life and have it abundantly is what he promises. But isn't it amazing how, how God calls sinners, right? Those fishermen, they're sinners. He calls us sinners, yes, and saints, of course, always and at the same time, to go out and do this, to share his love with the people around us. He calls a sinful guy to be pastor. You see, it's really utterly amazing that he would entrust this to us, this word, this, this saving message to, to us. And yeah, we don't always get it right, okay? But sometimes when we do, wow, what the, what the impact is on a person. But as we go through this life, you know, things happen. Life gets difficult. The pressures mount. It becomes very, very heavy sometimes. And, and sometimes our temptation is to, to fix it ourselves. We say, well, how could I fix this? Maybe um, I could find relief at the bottom of whatever bottle. See, that would, that would numb things and make them go away at least for a while. I would, I would feel better. Or, or maybe we try to find some, some drug or you know, Ill, illegal or legal or whatever. And maybe by, by taking that, we could be, you know, give us a little pep, a little, little boost. And see, that would, that would help with our problem. Sometimes we try things that, that are not so smart. Or maybe uh, we, we form a relationship with somebody, never mind the fact that we're married already. We think, well, if I just had a little, little zest in my life, see, that would, that would help things. I, I would feel better. Or we turn to the Internet where there's any perversion you want to find. See, that, that would help. That would get my mind off of things, wouldn't it? Of course... This is all sinful. And so what's the thing that we, we need to do? Well, we turn to God. Instead of turning to these other things, and there's a longer list of things probably, we turn to God. We turn to Him in prayer. Okay, just by turning to Him in prayer shows that we trust Him. And then we gather together to worship Him. Well, the same thing, that we're trusting in Him, that, that He loves us and we love Him. And we come to say, thank you, Lord, for all that you give to us. We turn to his word where we can find truth and ignore the lies that, that come at us from the world. And so when we find ourselves guilty of, well, turning to something else or somebody else besides God, we know that when we repent, God forgives. See, the, the blood shed on the cross covers us in our sin makes us white as snow and then we can always know that we have God's forgiveness we were talking about in Sunday school in David's class how yes we know we're forgiven but sometimes it's good to hear that you're forgiven especially when you're burdened by whatever it is and you go into the pastor's office or you go to a trusted friend and you, you confess your sins and hey, everybody here has the power to say by the authority and, and the stead of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, sometimes just hearing it in our head maybe, maybe isn't enough because also inside of our head, well, we deceive ourselves. So we, so we lie to ourselves in here. But to hear it externally, ah, so you can carry that around. right? You can go back to that. Your sins are forgiven, no matter what they are. And the great thing about forgiveness is, well, it's, it's freely given. It's, it's unearned. It's, it's undeserved. It's free-flowing. It's ever-flowing. God doesn't run out of forgiveness. And, well, maybe, how about us? You ever run out of forgiveness? <laughs> You, anybody here uh, perfect at forgiving others? I thought you put my hand down. Go ahead. <laughs> that was just for demonstration purposes only. <laughs> oh, yeah, see. 
sometimes we're like, no, I've had it with this person. They've done one too many things, and that's it. We're commanded to forgive. To forgive and to forgive just as God has forgiven us. It's really, I think, hard to wrap my head around. It's really inconceivable that he would forgive me for all of the stuff, all the mess, all of the chaos that I've created, that he would forgive me. And well, if he forgives me, then he forgives you. And what's awesome about the whole thing is that Jesus does all the work. You see, God does all the work. We don't do anything. We just, well, if you want to call it a doing of something, we give thanks. We say thank you. And that's about it, right? He calls us at our, in our baptism and says, you're now fishermen. You're now fisherwoman. Go and fish. But that's all him. That's not me. That's not you. That's all him. That's all the Holy Spirit working in you to deliver that word to people. See, he does everything. He does the work on the cross. He leaves the tomb. He does it all. And not only that, he promises that he is coming again. And we have a God who always keeps his promises, so he is coming. So either he's going to take you to him before then, or he's coming. Someone told me today that they pray that Jesus come before they die. You know, Pray that he comes. That we don't have to experience all that that trouble there at the end of life. Well, why not? You see, we pray that dinner table prayer, uh, come Lord Jesus. So what are you praying? Pray, come Lord Jesus. Today, I'm ready. We pray, come Jesus, come, and come quickly. And in the meantime, we are filled with his Holy Spirit, all of you, all of us, all believers, that comforts us, that strengthens us, that even points to our sin and leads us to confess and receive forgiveness and leads us out there, out there, wherever you go, wherever you work, wherever you go to school, whichever retired people you hang around, and you can take this same message to them because, see, now we are our fishers of men and we can take the saving gospel that Jesus died for you because he loves you wherever we go. Amen. May the peace that surpasses all understanding be with your hearts and your minds and Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for prayer.